Well, happy Aloha Friday. Thanks so much for tuning in. This is Spotlight Hawaii. I'm Ryan Kalei Suji, joined by Yanji Denise. Great to see so many of you tuning in here uh, on this Aloha Friday. If you missed the show on Wednesday, the conversation really focused on the rail as we spoke to CEO, uh, Heart Inter Interim CEO, Laurie Kahikina, which we dove into a lot of different issues regarding the rail, and we're continuing on that subject again today, Yanji. That's right. The Honolulu Rail Project continues to make headlines, uh, and we wanted to go straight to the source. So we invited former Congresswoman and now uh, newly appointed board member, reappointed, I should say, uh, Colleen Hanabusa, who is joining us now. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Thank you for inviting me. Good so let's talk. You. Let's talk about that journey from uh, the consulting contract to then deciding to pivot uh, to becoming an unpaid board member. How did this all first come about? You know, um, when I when I first applied for the consultancy, there wasn't a position available on the board. And it just happened that uh, the person who succeeded me when I was on the board and somebody that I've known for many years and have great respect for, decided that he would not be re-opting. So there was a conversation, I guess, that he had when the mayor uh, thanked him for his service and, and asked him the question about, well, who could fill your shoes? You know, you're a, somebody that everyone respects, and he is. And, uh, and he somehow they got on me, and he said that uh, I would be the great person to fulfill it. And I got the call and said, well, would you do it? And of course, everyone thinks you're crazy, right? Why would you give up money, especially with all the publicity? So all of the things that we've gone through all of that. And why would you give that up to go on the board? And quite honestly, I think that to see this project through, it really is to be a member of the board. And let me just take a short while to explain why. You see, the board in 2015, 2016, when I was on, and the board now have different responsibility and different, basically, duties and powers. The people of the city and county of Honolulu amended the charter and gave the board policymaking decisions, which the boards did not have before. So when I think about how to affect this, this project and how to have a greater say, it really would be as a member of the board versus a consultant to the board. So when I was asked, I said, you know, sure, why not? It, it was never about the money. It was more about being a part of a project that I, from the very beginning, I was in the Senate when we voted for the GET, uh, the first one. I was on the board when they did the second GET extension. I was in Congress when they did the latest one, Act One. So it's it's sort of a project that I have come to feel that it's so we've so invested in. But more importantly than that, the people have spent a lot of their money to get this project done. And I think it would be an absolute travesty if we all walked away from it now. And, and so with do you know what will happen to that consulting role that you were slated to fill? Will that go back out to bid for someone else to apply for, or will you essentially be filling in those duties? under your new role on the board? I have no idea. The only time I heard any response to that was, uh, I think, when Laurie responded to Yunji about that question. But that's still, that's an internal decision I would think that Hart makes. She is the contracting officer, Laurie Kahikine is, and uh, I assume it's going to be something that the board maybe in their next meeting will decide. So I don't know. I didn't even know that I was the only person bidding it. And, and they changed, the, pro they changed the, the, the certain parts of the project while the bid was ongoing. For example, it was only a six-month contract when they began, and then they made it into a six-year with options. But it was optioned in the six-year period. And that's where the huge, nice headline comes from. But imagine when I began the bid, it was only for six months. That was what they anticipated this position to be. So it's something that they can change and that as they did in the process. And so we just have to wait and see. And like I said, the contracting officer is Laurie Kaiki. Well, let's talk about the differences in those responsibility, because presumably, you know, that contracting position was to help to bring in money to fill this enormous budget gap. Are you still going to be taking on those responsibilities now that you're a member of the board or do you see the role as being different? I think that um, 
one of the things that I did do was to check the, uh, the, the rules and regulations, which the board now has. It didn't have it when I was on originally. And I think it's very clear that to speak for the board in any way, you have to have the approval of the board. So in response to your question, it's not that I'm hedging it. It's, it's I'm not on the board to July 1. And I would assume at that point in time, I would hear from my colleagues as to how they see the we're proceeding. And I'm sure that they could, in that process, ask that I do or assume certain responsibilities. But right now, it would seem that with the different subcommittees that they do have, that people who chair those subcommittees would be initially responsible to assist. But as a member of the board and someone who has history with this project, I am more than willing to take on the responsibility and be a productive member of the board or I wouldn't have accepted the position. You know, you said that you won't actually start till July 1st, but I have to imagine that you've already begun uh, looking into what has been done since uh, your time on the board back in 2015 through 2016. Uh, I'm wondering if you can tell us what you're finding out in these early stages while doing research and looking back at what progress uh, the rail has made and what are some of the differences between what you saw then and what you're seeing now initially? You know, I wish I could say that there were a lot of differences, but a lot of the major issues remain the same. For example, you know, a lot was made about this um, confidential report that you saw. Uh, I think it was Grassroots Institute that got it by a FOIA request. And it was, if you were to pause or stop at Middle Street, what does that mean? And I was uh, comparing that report with one that was done in 2016. On June 1st, and the reason I remember these dates is because something like this you would try to kind of traumatize as you so you remember. July, on June 1st, 2016, I was before the city council asking them that they release all the 6.8 billion, which is that first uh, GET extension, and because the heart would need the whole thing. But I was honest to the board, uh, to the council and told them, by the way, I don't think this is going to be enough money. I don't know what it would be, but I'm asking that. So they did. They had these certain conditions on it, but they did say, OK. And I don't know if you remember this, but back then, what the um, what Hart and the Hart chair then said was $1.2 billion and not a penny more. And you know, the first extension was $1.5 billion plus change. So you know, it was a totally different scenario. Then after testifying before city council, I was told by the engineers that, oh, yeah, it's it's more. And I said, well, how much more? And I will tell you, I told them we're going to have a hearing, which we did. And they have a, a handout associated with it. And the figure they came up with was seven point nine billion. And I said, you cannot go up one point one billion in a period of seven days because this hearing was held on June 8th, 2016. Some people I know think it's crazy that I remember these things, but I remember it distinctly because when you're when you're telling people, you know, six point eight billion and and then you say, I don't think it's enough, but I don't know how much more. No one's gonna believe that one point one billion is something and up in that from six point eight to seven point nine that you didn't know. And that's one of the things that's always bothered me about the relationship between the board and heart. We were convenient back then. They would ask us, oh, go testify or go do this. Or, you know, they don't like us. The city council doesn't like us so much. So you probably would have a better shot at it. And you feel like it's your relationships that's being traded on. And then you find out 7.9. And they tell you that in a period of seven days. So Middle Street, for example, a lot of the things that were discussed in that handout are exactly the same. Pause in Middle Street, build all the stations you can, P3 stations, you know, go to Nimitz. Should there be alternatives? These are the things that were all discussed back then. So it's very troubling that we're still having that same discussion almost five years later. Why, why are we having the same conversation? Why hasn't it moved further than that? So those are the things. And, the, and one of the other things that um, sort of along the lines of the frogs that you've heard about, you know, back in 2015, 2016, we had an issue of tendons. 
I'm not quite sure that they resolved it. I've been reading documents to find that. And tendons are the pre-stressed, basically, I call them, they're, you know, they're supposed to be like wires, but they're more like rebars that are within the structure. So that's how you do the structural integrity of, this, of the guideway itself. I don't know if you remember this, but they were snapping because there was something that wasn't plugged on the top of the guideway. Water was going in. So the question was, okay, how do we ensure the public that these tendons are fine? How do we do it? Do we get extra insurance? How do we do it? And the other thing was what they call plits. And I'm not sure plits is not related to the frogs. Plits is a system where you construct the, the track on the guideway right directly on the concrete versus having spacing. The problem with that is that, you know, you've got to pour that concrete perfectly. So then they found out that the plithless system didn't work. So as I look at all of this, I'm wondering how much of this is related, if at all. But these are questions that we have to answer. And I think that's the problem when we deal with, with rail is that, you know, it's a, the heart board is voluntary. And the volunteers come and go because it takes a lot of time to do it correctly and then they get bashed for <laughs> whatever and you know it's, it's a tankless position for a lot of them so I don't blame them but you know when you come down to it and I'm looking at it and I'm saying wow this sounds awfully familiar but more importantly than that are the questions that need to be asked are they being asked and what does it mean and is it just money it shouldn't be just about you know the whole situation with whether or not um, you're going to pay $130,000 a day for not running the rail. Uh, you've heard that figure. And I'm thinking, and I went back to the contracts, and I haven't verified it for sure, but what I've been able to find is Ansaldo was supposed to build those tracks. So how can the company that builds the track then benefit from a change order or a, a delay when they're part of the delay? But, you know, like I said, I have to go and verify that it, in fact, was that because I don't know how the contract shifted from Ansaldo to Hitachi. So these are the things I believe that as a member of the board, more than, for example, as a consultant. A consultant, I'm there to basically listen to what the board is saying or what the board wants. As a member of the board, I can voice what I think are the necessary questions that have to be answered for us to move this project forward. You know, you mentioned Middle Street there, and I'm just curious to get your thoughts because it's become sort of a, a shorthand for a, a possible uh, place where the rail could end. When Lori Kahikina was on with us on Wednesday, she said very clearly that Middle Street's just not an option because logistically you can't actually make it work. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, there are two issues there, logistically, whether or not it could work, um, and then also our agreement with the FTA and whether we violate that and have to give back a bunch of money. Do you think Middle Street is an option uh, to end the rail there? I don't think Middle Street is an option uh, because of the following reasons. The, not only is it an issue with the FTA and what we call the full funding grant agreement and the, the, what we had agreed to do, but more importantly than that, when Middle Street was being discussed in 2016, we had $6.8 billion. Now, since then, Act One is an intervening fact. And Act One is supposed to take us to $9 billion. So if Middle Street as a, an endpoint is being proposed because if people think we're going to run out of money, that's not true. We have the money coming in. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a matter of when the money comes in and how the money comes in. Because remember, in 2016, when they took the 6.8, it's the 2027. With Act 1, you have not only the TAT in addition to the GAT extension, but there's another three years of GAT, GET extension. So the question to me on Middle Street would be, is that the logical place if you're going to end it in terms of what they call an MOS? minimum operable segment. And it's called a minimum operable segment because that's exactly what it has to be. It has to be a, an operable segment. Remember, originally, the whole idea was we would go to Manoa. Ala Moana became the agreement under the FFGA. I always 
call it, well, that's the first minimal operable segment that we have. So we need to have a situation where it's a usable rail system. And I do not believe that to Middle Street is a usable rail system. And if you go back to the 2016 uh, handout that we did, it tells you where people get, where their boarding is. It doesn't tell you where people get off, but it tells you the boarding. So if you're looking at who's boarding rail and where they're boarding, Kalihi, which is after Middle Street, is a huge number. The largest place that people board, Ala Moana. So when you look at what was originally planned, it's about 120,000 people who board the rail. More than half is, I believe, post, post Middle Street. So that's a huge number of people that you are not going to have as part of it. So the, then the question becomes, does rail become operable at that point? And I don't think it's operable at that point. I understand the money arguments that people are making. However, think about the money that has been put into this and the money that is still out, outstanding. I think the three billion that you hear um, Laurie Kai Kina talking about, she's saying I'm giving people the number that I don't want to come back and say, and I think she said this to you, Yunji, I don't want to come back and say, there's more, which is every time it seems to have been a situation with dealing with, with heart was been, oh, we, we really need a one billion more, we need this, or we need that. And I think she's got a she's got the really the top number at that. But I have to still uh, go back and check the documents because one document that is necessary that I, I understand was not done is what we call the risk refresh, which is done every two years under the FFGA. And 2020, it was not done. And that gives you, for example, what the high end number, to give you, to put it in some kind of perspective. In 2014, the you hear P65, P whatever, you, those are the things that tells you the risk, where they think most of the risk, 65% probability that it will fall in that. In 2014, the P100 was seven point something billion dollars. And in 2016, the P100 was about 10 point something billion dollars. So there isn't one, and they didn't do a P100 in 2018. They didn't do a risk refresh in 2020. So I don't know what that number is, but it could be that that's the number that Laurie Kayakina is talking about. So it's the ultimate high end for the cost. You know, when we hear uh, of all of this and, and then a, a lot of the issues that are coming up with rail, uh, one has to wonder why would you take this uh, consulting job? I mean, it is uh, obviously a lot uh, of work, but, but I'm more wondering the larger question, how do you think we got to this point? Wh who do you think and what is responsible for just the cost overruns, the length of time that it has taken. Is it a failed leadership? Is it just poor communication? How did we get to this point where we are now looking at these tremendous cost overruns, uh, the public who is just frustrated with this project overall, and, and there just seems to just not be a lot of support now behind what this project was intended to do? And I agree, and that is the problem. Public confidence and, and Basically, the public's commitment to this project has just waned. When uh, in 2016, I think it, we, there were polls that had it at the highest, about 60% said, "Just get it done. <laughs> Go to Alamona, get it done." But but people, I think, were convinced that that they were getting at least some kind of information that made it make sense. What you have to understand is the reason why we have this problem is because. Part in the very beginning, and it wasn't until the Charter Amendment in 2016 that changed it, was had one purpose, and that was very similar to what you hear about the police commission and the fire commission. It was to hire and or fire the executive director. It had no policy decision making or anything like that. I tell people, I remember when I got on the board, I was told very clearly by the then executive director, you have to understand that the, and the charter did say this, by the way, that the board shall not in any way interfere with the administrative functions of heart. He said, envision it this way, Colleen. It's a window. He and the staff are inside. You board members are on the outside looking in. You can look in, but you can't come in and you can't tell us what to do. 
That's why the change in 2016. So in response to your question, Ryan, what I would like to see is that the board having now the ability to make policy decisions and the board having the ability to really watch what's going on in heart, that it will make the difference. And that's why I chose to come back on the board because I lobbied for the change in 2016 to the charter amendment. The people agreed. And now we have a heart board that should have its rules in place, should be watching the financing, things that it could not do before. Like I was told, you're on the outside looking in, don't come in. So with that, I'm hoping that the oversight of the board will make a great difference as to the running of heart. Before it was really the executive director who ran everything. So is this a failure then of leadership of the previous executive directors, keeping Lori Kahikina out of this obviously because she's just joined uh, in the last few months? Well, I think that there's there's a lot of, there's, there's also timing. There's also, I think what the real cause of it is the change, the change in plans, the change in directions. If you look at the project from the get-go, remember we're supposed to be one, what they call design build. In other words, the person who or DBB, design bid build, one entity was supposed to do the whole thing. And the idea was, and then when they broke it up, the idea was there would be some sort of economies of scale and at least economies of learning. So the same company would learn how to build rail towards the end in Hawaii. Not that they didn't know how to build rail anywhere, but it just in Hawaii, you would have that because we are very unique in terms of our topography and so forth. So I think that the changes, for whatever reason, the changes were done. That was a major cause. And then you, and because I think, unfortunately, um, people thought that money was, was available, that they could make these changes. And each time they did, they kept saying, we're going to cut costs, we're going to do this. You heard P3, you heard all these different kinds of situations. And that's where the problem is. I think it's the inability to really convince people exactly what it is that's necessary. And I'm pretty sure most of it was well-intended. However, you know, as they say, the proof is in the pudding. We have a problem and we wouldn't have this problem if, if everyone had thought this out all the way through. With the cost overruns, we're seeing how Hart is taking efforts to cut back on, on some of its operating expenses. Nearly 50 uh, employees were positions, their positions were terminated uh, recently when Lari Kahikina took over as a cost-saving measure. W I wanted to get your thoughts on that because there has been some pushback from unions about uh, that determination of these nearly 50 jobs. Do you think that those cutbacks were needed and necessary? You know, I don't want to second guess Lari Kahikina, but I have no idea what positions were cut. And I would assume that I've always felt that as the project goes on, we may not need the same number of people, but the question is, who are they? As you know, there's two sources of, of uh, employees, two major sources of employees. The pushback from the union are those who are city employees, about a hundred something city employees. And I think 50 or 40 something or 50 were cut. But they are also employees of an entity called HDR. HDR is like a consultant. So that's where a lot of your high-end employees are because what we end up doing, and it's always been troubling to me in the past, and what HDR, and it was somebody else before HDR, what HDR does is it takes a premium for the hiring of engineers who may have built rail before. So you have, those two sets, the ones that you hear the most pushback from are the ones who can push back. And that's, of course, those who are HGEA members, probably Unit 13. And they're saying, hey, you know, these people should not be cut without either the proper warn, you know, dislocated workers kind of situation or different kinds of things along the way. So until we, I mean, I can't opine on that because I don't know who it was. I would think, however, that um, she vetted all of this and the Corporation Council vetted it with her so that they, they didn't uh, violate anyone's collective bargaining rights. 
because as you know, I'm a labor lawyer. So <laughs> you're, you're asking me questions that are dear to my heart, which is, you know, I don't, I, I believe in collective bargaining. So that's part of the, the issue, but I can't tell you, but I do know that I've always felt that as the project moves on, shouldn't we expect the people who worked on the project to, to learn along the way? And shouldn't we expect them to be better at what they're doing? You know, whether you call it economies of scale or economies of knowledge, something's got to have given. You shouldn't be running the same number from the beginning to the end. You just shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Especially yeah. when we have the uh, operations and maintenance issues as well. Yeah. Senator uh, Maisie Hirono was on here recently. Senator Schatz has joined us in the past. They both said that the federal government is not going to be our knight in shining armor when it comes to bailing out that $3 billion uh, or whatever the final cost overrun is. Uh, it seems to change quite often. What do you think? Where do you think this money will actually come from? Ultimately, will it be the taxpayers and extending, uh, you know, the the GET, the TA, wherever it comes from? Ultimately, will it be the people of the city and county of Honolulu? You know, um, whether it's the federal money or the state money, they're taxpayers' money, right? But the problem is that when you look at the funding source federally. It really is what they call 5307, which is what the 210 million dollars which you have to replace. That's bus money, which is part of the original financial plan. And there are 5309 funds, which are what we call fresh start. The problem I see is that unless the Biden administration and its infrastructure plan is going to expand to existing projects, if you can't get a new start on a project that's been new started already. So the 1.55 is actually billion is actually the 5309 funds which we have received. Those are the two sources of federal funds that we are entitled to. So unless there's and, and I'm not quite sure yet what the infrastructure plan looks like because I don't think they've passed it yet. I watch it and I don't think they've passed it yet. It's going to require something like that, a change in their focus before you could expect that. Other than that, I think Senator Hirono and Senator Schatz are correct. Um, the question is going to be whether or not um, with bended knee, Hart is going to be able to go to FDA and say, hey, can you find another category that you could put us in and give us part of the funds? But it, if the congressional delegation is not going to be uh, with, uh, with Hart on this project, then it would they would have to look elsewhere. And remember, part of the problem is that the, in, also in 2016, what the people voted on is you took operations and maintenance out of out of heart of the rail and you put it into Department of Transportation Services. So there's that transition. And what people do not realize is the fact that within the quote Ansaldo slash Hitachi contract is operations and maintenance fees that were basically said that they would have. This is part of the first five years with an option of five. The question now is going to be, given the fact that the, the legislature has made it very clear that they will not subsidize operations and maintenance, do those uh, sons somehow become available? So these are all the different questions. First is how, how solid is the $3 billion and how much of that is because um, Ms. Kaikina said she's not going to come back and say that it's gonna be more. And I, I appreciate her position. And how much of that is gonna be that, that will, will be made up for as we look at issues such as to the year 2030. Remember, we have monies coming in to the year 2030. How we recover is also gonna determine that. Unlike the federal government with a 5309 funding, which said, this is all you're gonna get. 1.55 billion, that's all you get. The state funding on TAT and GET, though now we have the virus situation, the pandemic, take that out. But as the state recovers, right, it is based on a percentage of GET and the growth determines how large that percentage would be. So when you look at it, it's not the same number every year with GET. And right before the pandemic, because we had 10 million tourists, the numbers that were coming in were quite large, both on GET and TAT. So 
we have to look at all of that, right? I believe if I recall uh, Act 1 correctly, it assumed only a 3% growth in GET. That was how they calculated the amount of money. So when they tell you we have $9 billion, it is because that's how they calculated the growth of GET. So as I said, the, the thing about part, thing about financing, it all requires you to sit down and get the pencil out, sharpen it, and start looking at all of exactly what it is that we can anticipate. And right now with the pandemic, it's very difficult because we don't know exactly what those figures are. Because, you know, there are savings right now going on because uh, Laurie Kaikina has canceled the, what they call the CCUR, which is a big contract. She's canceled that. She's also canceled, um, and I think she's watching how the, the movement of the project is going to be. And if, and if there is movement in terms of how we're going to address the undergrounding and the major costs, remember, when I was on the board, they told me I had nothing to worry because I was always concerned about underground. And I said, you don't have enough money. And they told me, don't worry. This is, you know, because we could just look in and we're not supposed to participate. They just tell me, don't worry. We have $70 million. And I said, you can't underground for $70 million. And they said, don't worry. You don't. And they basically told me I didn't know what I was talking about. But look at it now. 400 something million isn't enough. The estimate used to be maybe 700. Some people are saying 800 million to underground. Maybe it's time to sit back and say, we can't underground. So what do we do? And something that I, and I, I was interested in that, that um, release because one of the things he talked about was running the lines within the rail itself or the foundation of the rail. That's something that I had asked in 2016 and they told me, no, you can't do that. But it's an alternative now. So maybe there's different ways of looking at it. One thing that I'm trying to figure out and I don't know, but one thing that seems attractive to me is move the lines, just the lines. Imagine that. We have 138 KVs on both sides in Dillingham. What if we moved it to a parallel street or something? What would that cost be? So As not a, adjusting the route, just adjusting uh, the lines. The problem with the route, I think, is that the, the route is going to be a, an issue because of the FFGA. So at what point do we, do we, can we, can we actually raise that? But can we move the lines? Because if you look at the, um, that handout that they did, one thing that's very clear is the reason why we, the city and we, HART, never collected money from Hawaiian Electric is because if Hawaiian Electric got in for expenditure of funds under the PUC, I'm not sure whether it went from two point, was 500,000, may have gone for 2.5 million, and maybe up to 5 million now. So if you expend any funds like that, you gotta go to the PUC for approval. Now, if you do that, you'll never get this project done. That's why you never see Hawaiian Electric contributing. I've always felt they should contribute. They're getting this underground system. They're getting, you know, uh, all of this is being done for, for the people's benefit. And one thing that always bothered me, I don't know if you know this, it's trivia, but it's Kalaniaanoi Highway, for example. They have ducks in the median street there. And who paid for that? 50% Hawaiian Electric, rate payers, 50% Department of Transportation. But they had to go to the PUC for that. You don't see the PUC in this. And th so the question is, if Hart is going to pay, then what if they move the lines and they have the approval of the PUC, I mean, not PUC, but Hawaiian Electric to do that? Maybe this is something that should be explored. So these are all different issues that go to the issue of the underlying issue, which is the cost. Because that's what everyone is appalled with, is the cost. And how could we not know? And I agree. I mean, I told them they didn't know what they were talking about, but they told me I didn't know what I was talking about. When I said 70 million, don't make me laugh, you know, but that's what it's all about. So that's what the problem with heart is. I think the problem with heart is that in the past anyway, it's been this, this, I think they had a false sense that they could always get 
whatever money they wanted. The federal government would kick in more. The state would kick in more. And I don't think they were very prudent in how they proceeded. Well, thank you, uh, former <laughs> Congressman Colleen Hanabusa, for just you know expanding on that. It, it's clear you understand what is going on with this project and that there is a lot of work ahead. But we really do appreciate you uh, providing as much detail as you had. I think uh, we uh, all come away from this conversation learning a lot more about where this project is and, and, and also how we got here. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Okay, we hope to have you again soon. Uh, it is always wonderful to hear from her. Uh, obviously, she knows this project front to back, and she said that she's getting up to speed now, reading all the documents. What's interesting there, she pointed out, is that the problems that existed, she says, five, six years ago when she was on the board seem to be the same now, but you know, financially worse. So it'll be interesting to see when she does join the board in the summer, uh, what you know, what she comes away with, and and also she said right at the top, if any of you missed it, that uh, when she decided to take that consulting contract, the board position was not available, and so that's why things sort of unfolded the way they did. Now we know that there are critics who think otherwise, but that is her explanation as to why things went the way they did. Yeah, and you can just hear from her explanation about the history and the funding mechanisms. You, you know, she's been referred to by some of her colleagues. Uh, as a policy wonk, you know, she knows the numbers, she likes the details, she likes reading, uh, and it's clear that she understands uh, a lot of the history of the project with numbers and components to it. And so, uh, you know, we'll see if she can use that breadth of experience that she's had in Congress and, of course, serving in the uh, Hawaii Senate uh, to really help to bring this project, I, I think, to a point where people can feel a little more confident about where it's heading. Right. And she basically said that Middle Street's not an option. So, you know, we keep hearing that sort of bandied about as possible, not possible. It sounds at this point that that is not possible. And, you know, part of her reasoning is not just what Lori Kahikina laid out here on Wednesday, which is that, you know, physically it's very difficult to make that happen. Uh, her point was ridership, that people, you know, need to go to at least the next station, which would be Kalihi. Uh, and really it's Ala Moana where they think that the bulk of the traffic will be taking place. So um, we definitely have an open invitation for her when she does get on the board. We would love to have her back in a couple of months. Uh, one of the other things, Ryan, that's been making a lot of headlines, of course, is the CDC's recommendation now that people who are fully vaccinated do not need to wear a mask. The governor uh, yesterday holding a press conference saying that he wants to keep masks on. We're going to be talking to him on Monday in depth about that and other things related to the pandemic. Yeah, we know that there's a, a lot of thought and there is a lot of conversation that's happening in the community right now about if the state should pivot and follow those CDC guidelines. But we'll hear from the governor as well as his explanation on this and other matters, including, of course, the vaccine verification program that was launched this week. We'll get an update on how that is going. Uh, next week, we will also be hearing from Maui Mayor Mike Victorino, who will be joining us uh, here on this conversation to talk about the developments that are happening on Maui. We know that there have been times where the island of Maui has seen a surge in cases, so we wanted to get an update from him, as well as there is a growing contention between tourists and locals there on the Valley Isle. So seeing how they will, how the county is responding to some of those concerns. Yeah, so lots to talk about. We hope that you have a safe and healthy weekend. Uh, we will see you right back here at 1030 with the governor on Monday. Until then, aloha. Have a great weekend.